Um, I have a question, but maybe let's. Do you want, do you want to jump in? Well, let me make two observations. First of all, thanks, uh, Cameron. I thought it was really fascinating. And I appreciate it, uh, the manner in which you introduced uh, a number of different disciplines in your, uh, uh, in your analysis. Um, so I thought it was very, very perceptive. Um, and I, I, it, it's a complex uh, issue to address, uh, as I'm hesitant to, to make any kind of suggestions of kind of additional work for you. But I, I think it would have been fascinating had you been able to, or if you would you choose to expand your case? Uh, I mean, the most obvious place would be to look at the, you know the uh, the Russian uh, dimension. And what I kept thinking of, which I thought was fascinating in terms of organizational roles, I suspect a few of you are familiar with this, although some of you may have heard me mention this in a different context. Um, but during the early 1990s, at a time when uh, Russian scientists at uh, their major nuclear labs were kind of struggling to figure out what they might do in this very, very different environment. Uh, a number of uh, scientists, nuclear scientists, uh, formed a company called the Chetek Corporation. And they came up with this idea uh, to promote the use of peaceful nuclear explosions for the destruction of chemical weapons uh, for environmental purposes. And uh, what's interesting in terms of, of your uh, kind of thesis, uh, the, the main international partner that they had in promoting this, uh, I, I remember I, I wrote a New York Times op-ed on that topic but I, I kind of stumbled into this uh, uh, activity, but they produced these glossy brochures and the Canadians raised to kind of promote this. But what was interesting was the commentary by some of the American uh, nuclear scientists who thought at one level this might seem like a harebrained scheme. On the other hand, they thought hmm, maybe this isn't such a bad idea after all. So you have your nuclear scientists attempting to dispose of chemical weapons using nuclear explosives. So it would be a kind of intriguing uh, uh, characterization or uh, illustration perhaps of how difficult this for organizations to alter their, their traditional uh, operating procedures. So I just, I, there are a number of other interesting cases which I think might reinforce some of your conclusions, but also might lead you in some of a different direction if you were to take an additional case. I don't know if you're thinking about expanding this in the future, uh, or whether you have uh, finished your essential work. Yeah, thanks for the really interesting comments. I haven't heard of this, uh, this nuclear to destroy chemical proposal. Um, so that's definitely something I'll look into more. And I, I completely agree that looking at other cases is now, um, from my sense, the next step forward. Uh, the Russian chemical weapons destruction case is a particularly attractive one because while, of course, there is less material available or uh, less accessible material than for the US cases, that which I have looked into so far, that being kind of the thing I'm looking at now, uh, it identifies almost exactly the same factors as we're seeing to be kind of strategic research sites in this work, that is uh, organizational inefficiency or sclerotic organizations, which of course were pretty common in the late Soviet Union, um, uh, lack of funding or cost growth associated with these techniques and the inability of the managing organizations to justify uh, pursuit of additional budgetary resources and so on. Um, so it suggests at least that the, the key factors identified here are applicable in other cases, and that would, one, broaden the international scope of this analysis, but two, kind of make use of this work by using it as a bedrock to see, okay, where do we look in these other cases? So, yeah, that's exactly the next step. Uh, no good to any the Russian chemical weapon destruction case is my current research area. There are two things I kept thinking about. This is really interesting, and I love, I agree with Bill, I love the kind of complexity of it and the different sort of lenses. One that I was thinking about a lot was sort of fundamental differences between chemical weapons and, and nuclear materials, specifically plutonium. One of the things that's interesting about chemical weapons is that they have pretty limited shelf lives. Now, obviously, there are things you can do to extend that. So the Iraqis didn't do that because they were deploying straight to the battlefield in the 80s, and we did do that 
so we had greater shelf life. But nonetheless, you could have had a CWC that literally didn't mandate destruction, and the things would become would have less military utility over time. And in some respects, the destruction challenge at that point is less about getting rid of a military technology and more about dealing with a safety environmental kind of hazard. Like when you were saying it would cost $30 million to take some quantity of chemical weapons up off the ocean floor, sure, but you literally wouldn't want them. Like they would be useless for battlefield purposes or something close to it. Although the devil's in the details, obviously. So that's one thing. One of the things that's interesting about plutonium is how persistent it is. Even plutonium pits, the latest in the last decade or so research suggests, have even longer lifespans than we thought, the, the way in which plutonium ages. So that strikes me as a really important variable. That there's a, the chemical weapons are less weapons. They turn into something a little different, it seems, uh, it seems to me. On plutonium, one thing I was curious about, I had a different narrative around the sort of failure of US-Russian efforts. I had the impression that one of the things the Russians were deeply invested in was this notion that their plutonium had energy value. And so in addition to concerns about irreversibility, they had this notion that they didn't want to bury it even in a very irreversible way. They wanted to use it as mocks, because for them, this was stuff that had some value. And in the US, for complicated political reasons, we've been deeply committed to not pursuing that path, and part of it is we don't want others to pursue it, because we perceive proliferation risks associated with that. So that has always, to me, felt like a really important part of the story, and I wondered in your story how important that was. Yeah, uh, so definitely good points. Um, on the first case, the uh, efficacy of chemical weapons over time and the persistence of, of weapons plutonium. Uh, that is, is definitely something I looked into and definitely something that I considered and in the end I see it as uh, something that actually supports a lot of the arguments I make because it increases the efficacy of disposal using this, this simple topology I use uh, for chemical weapons which uh, and in turn it also decreases the efficacy of disposal for nuclear weapons. Once you bury weapons plutonium uh, at a half life of 24,000 years it decays into uh, uranium-235 also a fissile material which has a half life of 700 million years. So it's going to exist permanently uh, unless you destroy it in some way. Uh, and so that would be even more um, uh, incentive for the Department of Defense to cheaply dispose of chemical weapons if you can do so in an environmentally friendly way. So not necessarily dumping it in the ocean, but yeah, simply letting it sit somewhere in a, a, a chemical depot for a few decades is going to actually get rid of it to a substantial extent. So that makes it even more surprising with the DOD uh, was willing to pursue this really expensive, really difficult, technologically demanding destruction mission. And I think the organizational factors um, and socio-political factors kind of go some distance in explaining why that seemingly uh, counterintuitive choice was made. And on the weapons plutonium side, kind of the same thing. Uh, its persistence and its long-term weaponizability would seem to incentivize destruction. Uh, and disincentivized disposal because, you know, if uh, it costs a few tens of millions of dollars to mine weapons plutonium or uh, if it's decayed weapons grade uranium from a geologic repository, then actually by burying it, you're almost creating a new problem, uh, which you know, kind of more money into or essentially indefinite physical security or something along those lines. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a really important aspect of this and one that I think uh, aligns with the the conclusions that I've drawn. Uh, on the energy value of plutonium, that's also a, a key point. And one that, yeah, you're right, I, I kind of gloss over um, a little bit. It, of course, played a, a significant role in actual initial negotiation of the plutonium management disposition agreement. There's a, a quote where a Russian negotiator told an American negotiator in the late 90s, you know, do whatever you want with your plutonium. We're going to convert it into nuclear fuel, but if you want to quote, uh, throw gold in the toilet, go ahead and bury it. Uh, so that was, uh, to some extent, a driver of US preferences on this option, or excuse me, of Russian preferences um, in this case. The US, as you mentioned, has kind of a strange uh, economy in its relationship with the funding as an energy resource where a number of uh, influential actors are highly in favor, particularly in the nuclear science community, of reprocessing and the number uh, of uh, influential actors are strongly opposed. Uh, that led to quite a, a great deal of contention and countervailing narratives between whether uh, the PMDA was actually a great thing because it incentivized the US to establish a civilian plutonium economy, regardless of what it had to do with weapons, at least uh, to some people, this was going to open the door to plutonium reprocessing as this great technological advancement in the US nuclear industry. 
and to others, of course, it was the worst thing ever because even if it reduces the size of the stockpile, you're still opening up this door for worldwide proliferation as other countries sort of have this uh, excuse for pursuing plutonium uh, separation for civilian purposes, uh, ostensibly. Um, so that's, yeah, that's a, a complicated dilemma and one that I've, I've glossed over a little bit. I don't, um, at this point, know exactly how to incorporate it. Uh, it's something I've been interested in doing is maybe interviewing people at NNSA uh, or around at that time to talk about how they incorporated these narratives into their uh, decision-making process. But yeah, if, if you have ideas for how to approach that in an analytic way, I definitely appreciate them. You can field your own questions from yeah, and comments from Bill and others. Yeah, two uh, other uh, points here. I mean, you, you very nicely look at the uh, issue of uh, the organizational culture and uh, organizational explanations. Uh, one might you know, consider uh, yet another level of analysis looking at the, the forms of individuals uh, as advocates. And again, and, and, and the, the reason I think it's important, I mean, you have, uh, I think if you only have you know, one or two cases trying to draw conclusions uh, from such a small end is, is kind of dangerous. And so I think it would be interesting to at least explore in some fashion the extent to which the organizational advocacy can be explained primarily in terms of individuals or not. I don't I really don't know the answer to the question, but it would be worthwhile I think to you know to ask the question. And since John looks so comfortable over there, I'm gonna uh, also ask a question that relates to South Africa. Uh, given uh, this is John Dupree, uh, a former South African diplomat uh, and international organizational uh, uh, representative who's now uh, with our visiting fellows program. But an interesting case has to do with dismantlement that's not driven by negotiated arms control and the theme of the South African nuclear uh, weapons program. Uh, and I always am intrigued with the question of why we still have such a large stockpile of weapons usable, usable highly enriched uranium. And so I mean, were there, was it primarily an issue of economic considerations, technical difficulties, which I doubt, or in fact, uh, is it a more uh, uh, a consideration of uh, HEU as a strategic asset? Um, you know the answer to that. Oh. I, know, I just I don't like you were just too comfortable there. You know, so I, I thought I'd throw it out there, and uh, because it is, it is another, it's another kind of instance of uh, a disma weapons dismantlement process, which was monitored in some fashion, uh, but the the essence of the weapon kind of remains in the form of this HU stockpile. You know, sure. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for, the, for the. I mean, I find uh, especially the last line of particular interest, um, and, and it relates. The last point there actually relates to, to Bill's point about um, working towards a fissile material currency. Um, in the context of, of your presentation, um, you know, the, it, that's where the problem lies with cuddle. Um, because you are addressing the stockpile in your, in your whole presentation. Cutoff does Cutoff addresses future production, um, and that's where the problem has been in the, in the context of trying to negotiate such a treaty because what is considered cutoff past production, production that takes place from the time that the treaty is negotiated to the treaty is in force. And that brings me to uh, Bill's point, and it's a valid point. Um, why did South Africa decide to keep, uh, at that time, probably was uh, two, three, maybe 500 kilograms of HEU. Um, and it was not all the bomb grade, you know, it's not all 90%. But six, seven devices, the amount of material that came out of there, you can make your own calculations. Um, and that was the. You reason seven why. devices now? It's thought it was six. 
Well, they were the seventh. Okay. They had enough material for, for a little bit more than that. Yeah. But estimated, they were maybe, you know, let's say, five, six hundred kilograms of, of highly rich uranium that came out. Um, the government has, at the time, I don't know, I argue that it has a strategic value. Um, and that strategic value is different than strategic, in terms of nuclear strategic value, in terms of nuclear weapons. It was considered that this was a significant investment by the previous government uh, during the apartheid era um, that sucked resources away from South Africa. Therefore, it is a strategic asset. But it's also a strategic asset in terms of the country's position itself um, with regard to efforts such as the Sao Matilda Cuttle, uh, as well as the emphasis on HEU versus no emphasis on plutonium in the civilian sector. So, to address that very quickly separately, uh, the South Africa, at least in my understanding, is the only country that non weapon state with weapons grade HEU and stockpile. And so the argument has been, yeah, I heard the government some time ago, that if you want to talk about the Sound Material Treaty, then it has to be it has to include stockpile. Um, if not, then why should South Africa give it up? So that one. Two, if you talk about the civilian sector, then why is the focus only on the HEU and not the massive amount of plutonium that sits in the civilian sector? Yeah, so I'm moving backwards through some of these really interesting points. Um, first of all, I think this, this idea of what the strategic value of fissile material to South Africa is is really interesting because it's quite different than the strategic value of fissile material to the U.S. And this uh, uh, dovetails with what you were talking about, about looking maybe not just at uh, an organization as a whole, but at individuals. Uh, there's also some level, I think, that would be interesting between that. So in the sociology and technology literature, a lot of the work talks not about an organization, but about a relevant social group as a uh, group within an organization with a certain set of values that uh, fights or collaborates with other organizations or other uh, social groups within that organization to pursue certain goals. And so, in the Department of Energy, for example, we might see a relevant social group that is interested in promoting. Uh, uh, reprocessing of plutonium for civilian energy purposes, and we might see another relevant social group that is interested in, interested in preventing that because they're more interested in international non-proliferation. And uh, in my analysis, I really kind of group all of that together in the Department of Energy as an organization, and that's definitely a, a shortcoming. And uh, of course, there's you know um, a limit on how much analysis you can do. Uh, this is something I would like to incorporate in the next step, maybe um, looking at more granular levels of analysis within organizations and what those tensions are and what the intra-organizational uh, intra battles that are going on are and how those affect the decision-making process. Um, so that's a really good point. And there is also in this sense sort of uh, at the international level different relevant social groups between these social conceptions of the role of the stockpile in the United States and the role of South Africa's stockpile as a strategic asset for very different strategic purposes. Uh, on the, the FMCT, or of course we might call it an FMT if we're uh, talking about certain states that are interested in it not being just a cutoff on production, but actually one that addresses fissile material stockpiles. Uh, that's a, a key debate in pursuit of such an agreement. And it's not just South Africa, it's Pakistan and India, which are also quite concerned about the fact that a cutoff would be inherently discriminatory because states with quite large stockpiles like the US and Russia would be able to retain that whereas those that are still building stockpiles like Pakistan and India uh, would be unable to expand those. Um, so in one sense, that's uh, even further justification for pursuing weapons plutonium stockpile reduction and high-enriched uranium as well, uh, because without that, uh, FMCT or FMT would seem uh, a bit unachievable. And I think that ties into my last point here, where maybe the only path forward for either of these is to combine them. Uh, each relies on the other. You can't really have a cutoff unless you're going to address existing stockpiles, as we see from the protests of certain states. 
and also uh, if we're not uh, pursuing a cutoff for any other kind of fissile material focused arms control regime, uh, it seems that it might be quite difficult to achieve any kind of stockpile reductions because you don't have much of an impetus for doing that in the first place as a U.S. policymaker. Uh, so combining those two might be a fruitful avenue. And uh, yeah, the South Africa case is a really interesting one. Um, I, I say at the very beginning of this talk always that stockpile reductions, even though they're often overlooked as kind of the least important back end of the arms control cycle, they're really, in one sense, uh, almost the most important part because they're what makes everything else permanent. So in the South African case, actually, when I was starting this work, I was looking at the available cases or the cases in which information uh, was available. And actually, was kind of surprised, not knowing much about the South African case, to learn that that high-enriched uranium was still uh, in storage, essentially. Um, so that is an interesting case to look at, perhaps, as uh, an instance where a state got all the way to the end of the cycle and then stopped where they didn't actually pursue stockpile reduction in the first place. And from the discussion we've just heard, um, there are some interesting uh, lessons there about why a state might not necessarily try to pursue stockpile reduction and fail, but not pursue it in the first place. And it's actually similar reasons that it fulfills some uh, socially developed, socially constructed strategic role uh, that it might not in other states, for example. So yeah, definitely. Um, hopefully a, a future uh, locus of analysis. Is there other questions? Yes, I have one question. Well, I have a, a really late presentation, uh, by the way. Um, so in terms of different techniques for plutonium disposition, did you find any difference in acceptability of, for example, that we always think about is um, you know, geological repository versus uh, deep borehole disposal? Um, because in the one you can retrieve, in the other one you can't. And you can imagine you could have some sort of treaty where you have safeguards and monitoring over the borehole disposal. Um, because I think it's so different in terms of how how um, easy it is to retrieve the material, and it's much cheaper than other than say geological repository or something like this. Do you think there's some possibility there in, in terms of? future treaty or anything? Yeah, so just to clarify, um, for retrievability, uh, you mean for possible or the risk of reincorporation into yeah, it? So it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, you're talking about in terms of a different philosophy, you're talking about institutionalization and the undesirability of the weapon and material. If you, believe, if you think that plutonium has some sort of um, value, then you would put it in a geological repository with the site where you would, would put it because you can use it in the future. But if you believe that it has no value, you know, absolutely no value, either destroy it, it's expensive, or you dispose of it in very deeply so it's basically impossible to get access to it in the future. Yeah, uh, so this is a really important point, and actually um, my other area of work is on the retrievability of, of weapons plutonium potentially buried in the waste isolation pilot plant. Uh, there's a really uh, a lot of interesting social uh, factors at play there. So I think one of the key, uh, the key differences between the Russian conception of this and the US conception of this, which are worlds apart, uh, is the conceptualization of uh, what plutonium is and why one might bury it, so, or why one might dig it up. So uh, the US position has consistently been that plutonium buried in the waste isolation pilot plant is, I think there are documents uh, using the words uh, effectively irretrievable or functionally irretrievable, something like this, and that's obviously not true. Uh, one can make an argument that it is so observable, that retrieval would be so observable through even facile um, uh, satellite or aerial imagery that, you know, it's, it's not realistic that the U.S. would do that instead of just producing new plutonium, which would be more clandestine and take about the same amount of time. Uh, so there are different uh, conceptions of plutonium at play here, where in the Russian case it's seen as a resource, a resource just like natural uranium is as a mode of energy production. And uh, like most resources, like bauxite or uh, uranium ore, it's something that you dig up from the ground and then extract the useful metal from to extract energy from later. Uh, so digging up plutonium buried in a geologic repository would be really no different than digging up uranium in the first place. It's an ore that you mine for, you extract the usable metal, you put it in your reactor. So it kind of makes sense that the first thing as a Russian actor or a Russian negotiator that would come to mind is, hey, you want to just create a plutonium mine. That's not really an arms control uh, step forward. Uh, 
On the U.S. case, there's a very different uh, kind of just discourse surrounding plutonium where it's not a resource in any sense, it's a waste. And of course, what do we do with waste? We put them in landfills. You bury them and you don't dig anything up out of a landfill because you just don't want it in the first place. So uh, to a lot of U.S. policymakers or U.S. negotiators on the PMDA, this seems almost ludicrous, the idea that the U.S. would ever do this in the first place. And so uh, American decision makers in that case tend to attribute Russian objections to ancillary issues. Oh, you know, Russia's upset about this other thing, so they're making this uh, non-serious argument. And so there's really a disconnect between um, just these social conceptions of what plutonium is that hinders progress in that area, I would say. Um, but yeah, retrievability is a, a major issue. It maybe doesn't matter so much at this point because the arms control context for the burial of plutonium has fallen apart anyway, so if the U.S. buries it, uh, Russia is not going to do anything differently. So uh, the worst case is kind of just a waste of money on the U.S. side. Uh, there are also arguments that could be made that it's actually, you're worse off once you bury it because it's no longer monitorable. You can't directly see the plutonium, so the uh, size of the U.S. stockpile would then, for any international observer, depend on the extent to which that observer is confident that the U.S. would not try to recover it. And there are, in fact, methods of recovery of actinite mining that are very low footprint. Uh, you don't need to dig a huge quarry. You can position a single drill rig over a plutonium resource for a week and have something out. Um, so yeah, that's a huge part of this issue. Uh, it isn't something that, from what I have seen at least, has played into U.S. decision making in any serious way just because it's kind of brushed to the side a lot of the time. Uh, so hopefully in a if there were a hypothetical renewed PNDA and the U.S. was going to bury this material, something like deep boreholes, or at least burial in uh, crystalline basement rock, granite, or something like this that is much harder to mine, would probably be something that should be on the table. Do you accept the proposition that reactor grade plutonium is just as good as weapons grade plutonium in advanced? technology stays, how does that affect your observations? Yeah, uh, so this is uh, something that played a big role in negotiation of the PMDA as well. And in this analysis, I try and you know, not concern myself too much with it uh, and be a little bit agnostic uh, because this is about what decision makers decided to do rather than what a uh, technological assessment would say your end state is in terms of weaponizability, for example. Uh, the U.S. approach um, and the U.S. position that was enumerated in this 94 National Academy of Sciences report was that you established what they call the spent fuel standard, which is that if you irradiate plutonium in a reactor, you're essentially converting weapons-grade plutonium to reactor-grade plutonium. It's still weapons usable, maybe less so, but still weapons usable. I'm sorry, I'm not following that. If you irradiate plutonium in the reactor, you convert it. And not as mox fuel, but it just burn it longer. Uh, well, I mean, so you would put it uh, in the reactor as mox fuel, most probably. You don't have to, but that's kind of an economic way forward. And the justification for doing this for irradiating plutonium in a reactor is that it goes in as weapons grade plutonium and it comes out as reactor grade plutonium. So the isotopic composition has been altered to some extent, and reactor grade plutonium is not as good as weapons grade plutonium for use in a weapon but still can be used in a weapon. And the extent to which it's not as good is arguable. Uh, and so that's something that really plays a role in uh, the disarmament or uh, arms limitation that you would achieve by an irradiation-based soft pot reduction. That said, uh, from the US perspective and in this National Academy of Sciences report, the benefit of irradiation that was emphasized was not the fact that you change the isotopic composition from weapons grade to reactor grade, but rather that when you take that out of the reactor, that MOX fuel, you now have a highly radioactive soup of uh, uranium, plutonium, minor actinides, and so on. So it's essentially spent nuclear fuel because conventional spent nuclear fuel has reactor grade plutonium in it as well. And it's this radiation barrier to extraction, to recovery of use of that plutonium that is actually the main thing preventing it from reincorporating, uh, being reincorporated into a nuclear arsenal. So it depends on who you ask. The Russians uh, tend to emphasize the isotopic adulteration as the most desirable change associated with this means of disposal. Americans tend to emphasize the radiation barrier as the most desirable uh, output of this approach. Regardless of which perspective you take, there is some reduction in the weaponizability. 
of this material, but that weaponized ability is, of course, not eliminated. And so that's something that has to be taken into account when we talk about uh, a stockpile reduction. You know, you still have weapons usable material to some extent. Can I ask one more, uh, make a comment on a question, and we're close to the end of our time, but if others have a final one, we probably have time for that as well. Um, so I really love your insights on different U.S.-Russian perspectives on technical issues, because there's this sense, I think, sometimes that sort of facts are facts, or technical things are technical, or science is science, and this sort of sociology of science observations here, and I just, my mind goes elsewhere, and so I, I'm just sort of flagging that as something that, obviously, there's a rich literature there, but, but that's really fascinating in this domain um, to include in other areas. Question, and so I take a central part of your argument to be that the kind of sociology of how people thought about these weapons or technologies was different. Chemical weapons were seen as undesirable, not having a deterrence effect that that enabled their destruction. Plutonium was different, right? It was seen as having this deterrence effect. But it kind of seems to me that, one, plutonium destruction seems a little bit distinct from one's views about the value of nuclear weapons. And if anything, the more hawkish people, I suspect, are more on board with the MOX reprocessing side the tellers of the energy department, and the more dovish people, the Oppenheimers, are more on board actually with disposition. So it's almost like the opposite of what your argument would suggest. So it seems to me that with plutonium, right, there's this vast excess, and there's an agreement to dis dis destroy the excess, even among very hawkish people, because they feel like what we do have is more than adequate. Um, and so then, why would this perception of deterrence value of the plutonium necessarily shape one's approach to whether one advocated for MOX irradiation versus disposition? Yeah, that's an interesting argument, and maybe one that I've overlooked to a certain extent because I didn't engage much with this um, idea of uh, desirability of uh, plutonium economy as an impetus for pursuing stockpile reductions by a certain method. Uh, there is also the, the cost dimension. So, um, you, you know, there is a good argument can be made that, uh, in general, the more the hawks tend to prefer um, reprocessing uh, because at least it will achieve, uh, you know, uh, proliferation, not proliferation of nuclear weapons, but proliferation of this uh, energy generation technique. Uh, there's also the argument that can be made that, well, this is part of the defense budget, so if you're a hawk, then you're not going to be a big fan of. 30 to 100 billion dollars going to the construction uh, within NSA, an NSA going to the construction of a uh, facility for dismantlement of weapons or for destruction of a portion of the stockpile, and that money could be available for other actual um, defense-oriented NSA activities. Uh, how those tie together, though, that's really something I would have to. Do. I think interviews would be the best approach to, um, to studying that to see, as, as I mentioned earlier, how these narratives about the desirability of plutonium reprocessing for civilian energy purposes uh, influence the NNSA and DOE decision making on this um, issue. But yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good point and, and one for future analysis. Uh, and then on the, the sociology of technology side, I think that's exactly uh, the main point with this work and most of my work, that there's a lot of interpretative flexibility when it comes to technical issues, and a lot of the time these are socially constructed uh, and differ substantially between countries. So when you look at international arms control, that's one thing you've got to consider, that what uh, reversible disposal, for example, means to a US negotiator and to a Russian negotiator are very different despite having the same technical basis for those analysis. Um, so it looks like we've got one last question. <coughs> Hey, I, I caught um, a pretty big portion of the last part of your presentation with one I could hear was really, really fascinating. But I was very curious, um, to what extent does the irradiation of uh, plutonium in MOX fuel need to be taken out of the reactor because it's no longer viable an energy resource? My question is, when when the goal is to irradiate it, and, um, and not to place it, but rather irradiate it, at what point is it taken out? Is it taken out because they say, okay, this is enough, and and, uh, and uh, now it can't really be used in uh, as weapons grade plutonium, or do they take it out because they go, okay, this reactor can't run it anymore. And, um, and I want to know what 
So what what is that? And then um, I want to know if you knew Russian versus American perceptions on that process specifically, because I think that's very interesting. Yeah, uh, the way it would work is very similar to how conventional nuclear fuel works. Uh, and actually the idea is that with this mixed oxide fuel, that is uh, uranium oxide conventional nuclear fuel with some of this plutonium added, it's actually quite similar neutronically to uh, conventional fuel. So the idea is that you could take a existing operating civilian reactor, replace a few of the fuel rods with this MOX fuel, and operate it in exactly the same way you were before, before there was any additional plutonium in there. Uh, so it would be removed at the same time that conventional spent fuel would be removed, and for the same reason, that as you irradiate it, you build up neutron poisons, and so your uh, reactivity becomes um, unfavorable after a period of uh, years. So in the end, you would end up with still spent nuclear fuel, basically. Uh, as you mentioned, it would have energy content that would be hypothetically useful. Uh, if you wanted to use that, you would need to reprocess the fuel to get the neutron poisons out, recover the plutonium, and so on, uh, and convert it back into fresh fuel. Doing that would, of course, raise issues of what you're actually achieving. If you're, you know, taking some weapons grade plutonium, irradiating it, and at the end you take plutonium back out, it's now reactor grade, as we discussed earlier. But actually, the difference between reactor grade and weapons grade plutonium for weapons use is uh, arguable. And uh, can you repeat uh, the second question? Oh, I wanted to know, uh, well, I mean, you basically answered the second question. Since the difference is pretty much negligible, I would assume that um, that Russian perceptions on that process, at, on that point at which the, the MOX fuel is removed versus U.S. perceptions, you basically answered the question because it's so negligible it doesn't really matter anyway. So. Yeah, Russians tend to see isotopic adulteration as really a substantial hindrance to weapons use. I, I think one, um, one uh, Russian nuclear scientist I've talked to has put it this way, uh, why would the US use a plutonium Toyota when they have a plutonium Lexus available? That is, it's weapons usable, but it's not the best. And so at this early stage, if we're talking about getting rid of just a small portion of the stockpile, uh, any degradation of its weapons usability is important because there's still all this Lexus plutonium available. So even converting that to reactor grade would be useful to some extent. Uh, on the Russian side, they're actually their plan when they were going to burn some of their weapons plutonium under the PMDA in reactors was to use uh, fast reactors, so a different, more advanced design in some senses. And that is quite different in the character of the material you get out of it. Uh, if it's operated in a conventional fast reactor way, you end up getting actually a bunch of plutonium out of it. Yeah. Uh, so in one sense, that would be worse. You end up with more than you started with. So these are some key uh, technical issues that actually have been negotiated to a great extent. So under the PMDA agreement, uh, Russia's operation of their fast reactors was mandated to be in such a way that they weren't producing additional plutonium. Uh, so it was actually all worked out, and unfortunately that agreement ceased to exist. So now the Russian Federation is still going to operate these reactors, and they're going to be producing way more plutonium because they're no longer uh, hindered from doing so by any bilateral agreement, unfortunately. Thank you very much. Well, this was really fascinating, so thank you very much. Um, and I hope that you stay engaged with us in whatever capacity is relevant. Thanks so much. Thanks.